Okay, uh, yeah, so it sounds like the sound is on. Good morning. Um, clock has uh, turned to nine, so I'll get started. My name is uh, James Westfall. I work for Tumra Systems. Uh, uh, we make uh, RVM machines, so uh, I imagine most of you have experience with our machines, uh, putting your empties into uh, uh, empty bottles. Uh, so yeah, called a reverse vending machine. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, how we're doing large scale testing of embedded software on uh, many different software branches and on a lot of different machine targets. So 30 plus machines each night and go into how we have uh, uh, managed it. Um, yeah, I'd like to start with a little survey. Uh, so, uh, what do you identify as? <laughs> uh, are you, a, and I can use this survey to um, adjust my talk a little bit. Do you identify as a developer, a tester, or non-binary? Uh, so, we'll take a show of hands. Identify as a developer. Oh, wow, okay. Any testers? Identify as a tester. No testers. Oh, one. Good. Thank you. Welcome. Non-binary. Yeah. Okay. The great thing about non-binary is you get to be both. It's not neither. It's, it's both. So that's clearly what I identify as. Um, yeah. A little bit of an intro disclaimer. Um, we're talking about uh, how we're doing large-scale test ops. So that's a bit of a uh, neologism made from des DevOps and test. So I hope that's understandable. I think I'm not the only one using that term. Uh, and talking about practices, organizations, and tools. But I'm not here to preach. I'm not going to give you any rules, laws, and flexible principles or anything dogmatic, even though the way this type of talk goes, it might really sound like it. And maybe I'll be a little bit eager. So it might sound like I'm saying you have to do it this way. And it is not the case. The case is this is what we're doing. We think this works. This is what we've come to after trying and failing. But uh, uh, you don't have to do it this way, but take it for what it's worth. Uh, if you get inspired, if you get any good ideas, use them. Uh, and one thing, I am I like to be fairly rational. So when I do something or we do something, I like there to be a reason behind it, not just, mm hmm Yeah. OK. Uh, is this talk for you? <laughs> uh, I think actually, since I've got uh, more developers than uh, testers in the audience, it, it might actually be the case because I'm going to be talking about things that uh, developers are very used to and a lot of testers actually aren't. Uh, I had uh, talked recently to a consultant and on, he looked at uh, everything we're working with and uh, automation servers and automatic uh, deployment with Ansible and uh, Elastic uh, uh, Stack and uh, he said, but I'm, I test software. And uh, I said, yeah, we also do that, but we're doing it on a big scale. We're doing it with a lot of targets and a lot of branches. So we need some tooling to get that to work. It's not roll out your website on a test server and click through it. It's a little bit of a different thing. And also, we're working with embedded. How many people are working with embedded here? Yeah, oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. Um, one thing that really inspires me, I don't know if anyone is, so I get developers here, so that's great. You haven't seen this, maybe. Uh, the Growing Agile, great website, can only recommend it. And uh, uh, <laughs> um, this is a slide I really like. And this is, yeah, we've got a board, but are we Agile? We've got something that looks very, very waterfall-ish. Development, and after that, test. And the tester is not so happy because they've probably got a ton to do and they're probably a big bottleneck. Uh, we've got to do dev and test as an own, as a own column that comes afterward. So it looks, it looks very waterfall, even though we've got a board. Um, what we're trying to do, and I think we're definitely not the only one, is we're seeing, saying that test is an activity. Test is something that goes on the whole time. If you're in to, if you're read up a little bit on uh, test uh, 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 practice and foggy sort of things, uh, the idea is shift left. We start with doing testing from the start of a project. 
And uh, I'll talk about a little bit how we at Tumra are doing this shift left. Um, so and the testers are a lot more happy because they don't get the big cast ball at the very end that they have to fix. Um, how are we putting test as an activity, not test as a stage into practice at Tumra? Um, <laughs> one thing we do is uh, we write our test in JIRA. How many people use JIRA? Yeah, pretty much everybody, right? Um, we generally write it in Gherkin, you know, that given when then language. How many people are familiar with Gherkin? Yeah, okay. And Goiko uh, uh, Adjik uh, has a nice reflection about Gherkin. It's text field friendly. So you can write your test in Gherkin in Jira. It's something that works very nicely there. Um, one thing, talking about the shift left thing, everybody, including testers, are responsible from the start. So they're part of an agile team. Um, and um, that means there's no archeology. span Usually as a tester, when you have your own column and you get the big, I don't know how to say cast ball in English, even though it's my, my native language. If someone has a good translation, tell me. Uh, at the end, uh, usually the developers have moved on and have forgotten everything. So there's a massive process of archeology span trying to figure out how is this thing supposed to work? And it, it never works, actually. So it costs maybe a little more upfront to have everybody involved in the conversation from the beginning. But the payoff is much larger than the cost. Um, yeah, uh, automate or not. Uh, if, uh, so this test, uh, we write it in Gherkin. Maybe it's just going to be a one-off test that a tester is going to do manually on one of our uh, reverse vending machines. Maybe it's going to be something that will be automated. If we're going to automate it, uh, we write our code in C++. And uh, there's a great uh, test framework called Catch2. I'm excited for the talk later on in the day. So we write our Gherkin spec. Uh, uh, and uh, then we turn that maybe into a Catch2 spec or maybe we turn it into an end-to-end -end test, depending on where's the best place to test this. And a uh, nice thing with Catch2, for example, is testers, people who maybe aren't writing so much C++ code, actually can read the test, understand the test, and say, oi, um, have you thought about this? So it actually becomes, includes everybody in the process from the beginning. Yeah, and uh, talking about the test as an activity rather than as a stage, we run the tests every night on a lot of different software branches. So this is probably our test's biggest contribution to development, that we are giving you immediate feedback while you're building things. And uh, everyone knows <laughs> has implemented a new feature and broken something else. So it's great that somebody has your back and you've got tests running um, to help you. And uh, so not just uh, not just uh, unit tests or integration tests, code tests, developer tests, but also end-to-end -end tests. And I'll talk about how we can make this work. Um, yeah, so here's an example of a test written in JIRA. Yeah, so we've got something called item archive. We have these uh, reverse vending machines that you stick your bottles in and they collect a lot of physical data that takes up a lot of place, uh, space. And uh, sometimes for diagnostics, we uh, store that somewhere, but uh, it takes up a lot of space, so the machine can run out of disk space and crash. Uh, this was a bug, obviously. Uh, so uh, we have another tool called burning, which is pretty uh, usual when you have uh, are making machines. We move all the moving parts on the machine for a while, and we make sure everything more or less functions. We had a problem. Burning was turning on this item archive thing or turning off this item archive thing in the field. Machines were getting disk full and crashing. So we wrote a test for this, and this is our test we wrote. We wrote the test in Jira. So simple as that. Uh, this one, we decided to automate with behave. Is anyone familiar with behave? Python behave, not j behave. Okay. Something I will mention quite a bit, can only recommend it. It's really, really like it. Uh, this here, GUI, is actually something that we in Tumra have developed. And it's quite nice. You see there is a translation. It was something shorter. But if you read the text here, there is, you can clearly see, the one leads to the other. And this is using test steps that we have defined, and these test steps are Python functions. And you can just drop the test, set, test step in your test, and you can move it around really, really easy. So it's actually much easier to refactor this kind of test than a code test. And uh, this GUI we have also helps people uh, non 
uh, developers, testers, find existing steps they can use in their test. Um, yeah, so we have a bit of a labor division, a natural labor division here. Uh, developers, they maybe are going to write this down here, the uh, Python code, uh, and the testers are going to move them around. What's very fun is often the testers use them in a completely different way than what maybe the developer thought when they made it. And there's maybe a dialogue about adjusting, okay, how this test step isn't really working right. Uh, can we, can we, uh, can we change it a little bit to make it work. And uh, this is very nice. These are conversations that are happening that lead to understanding. And everyone is involved. Everyone's working together. And this tool is nice because uh, if you're a developer, yeah, maybe the code makes more sense to you. But if you're a tester, the stuff written in domain language makes uh, sense to you. So it's a nice place where worlds come together. It's nice when worlds come together. Um, yeah, so I've mentioned this. Agile, actually, and I've gotten a bit to this, these Gherkin specs, they can be refactored really fast. It's easier to, oh, we need a new variant of that scenario. That, you just copy and paste more or less, change a few steps, reorder a few steps, there you've got it. Uh, so it is really, really agile. It goes really fast. So this idea that the testers are involved from the start, you're making the software, the requirements are changing because requirements always change. So <laughs> that's just a given. But given that it's so easy to move this stuff around, generally the testers can keep pace with those changes. And it's so much better to be making those changes early on and being involved than getting the big, I don't know what cast ball is again, the big clump at the end and, hey, you test this, we're doing other things. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is the test lives on, the spec lives on as not only documentation, not only as human readable documentation written in the domain language, but actually something fairly fantastic and exceptional, correct documentation, unless of course the test is read. Um, so this Gherkin language here and uh, test written in Gherkin has a bit of a superpower. Uh, when you're writing unit tests. Uh, uh, refactoring reused code in your unit tests is generally speaking, or any code, is generally speaking a good idea, obviously. You want to keep things dry. But the problem is, in the test world, when you've got some setup, or maybe you're following the AAA pattern, arrange, act, assert, and you've got some common arranging to do in your test file, it's really nice to just bring refactor that out to a function, but it makes your test less readable. The thing that is really great with these Gherkin frameworks, and you don't have to use behave, you can use jbehave, you can use, you have them for basically all languages you can think of. Uh, sharing a function via a Gherkin test step, so refactoring it out for reuse, doesn't make your tests less readable, it actually makes your test more readable. So that's, that's what's cool. Let me give you an example. Um, so we can imagine we have some little code bit like this, and we're testing logging in on the system. And obviously, <laughs> you shouldn't be able to log in if your password has failed. And uh, OK, I've got to get some data here and initialize a few things. I'm arranging. And uh, there's a few mysteries here. You can more or less suss out what I'm doing here, but it's not really spelled out. There's maybe some assumptions. Let's look at this in Gherkin. So same test, right? Login with expired password fails. So I have a test step I'm starting with initializing the database with an expired uh, user. And down here, and this is behave, by the way. So this is one implementation of running your Gherkin spec. Uh, here, I can actually execute other existing steps. And these existing steps are written in natural, understandable language. So now you see the whole story. Yeah, okay, I'm creating a user, great. I'm setting the expiration date for the user, great. And I'm setting the system time to be such that it comes after user's expiration date. So all questions are answered. I don't think that was the case in the previous test. You had to click into that function and read, oh, okay, uh, yeah, I understand. Um, 
Another thing, uh, test review. These kind of tools uh, give you, and actually this GUI that uh, we've made, which uh, we, I've been told I should say we are most likely open sourcing, so I'll give you the contact details uh, afterwards, uh, allows you to do something that we like to call test review, which is exactly like code review. And that's maybe not something, usually in code review, you're going through unit tests, for example, and reviewing those. But test review as an independent thing, as an activity. Uh, and here we use this GUI where we have the human readable steps and we have the implementation down there. So the developers and the testers get together and they have something that they can relate to and they understand. And so they can have an informed conversation, even though to some extent, most developers and testers live in different worlds. Test review tips. Uh, tests are storytelling. We talked about user stories and sort of BDD style really encourages you to write tests that are narrative, some kind of story. Dave123 logs in when his password has expired. But uh, uh, there are different kinds of stories. And one thing that's really important is in a test review is to make sure that you haven't written a mystery. Are there salient details that uh, are missing? How can we add them? How can we make them appear? Um, yeah, OK. Now switching gears to another thing. Uh, another completely different topic here. We're at Tumra. We have 30. We have a nice machine lab, but we have only a certain amount of space for all these machines. And when we're testing on these machines, we have one really big constraint. I'll take a look at the clock, too. Oh, the clock is there. Yeah, I can't see it. OK. Machine time. I don't know. Uh, Others who are working with embedded, is machine time a problem? Yeah, okay, good. I'm glad I've made assumptions that are relevant. Uh, so how do we, how do we manage that? Uh, <laughs> if this was a tester conference, this might be something shocking. It's, uh, I bring in an automation server because I don't think testers are using automation servers that much. They are maybe uh, in one way, but uh, so use an automation server. Uh, Jenkins or Travis or um, GitHub Actions, whatever you want. Um, but this is a thought that maybe some people haven't thought. You developers, yeah, yeah, you build the software, then you run the tests. When we're talking about end-to-end -end tests on a limited machine park, why am I going to wait for your software to compile before running my tests? Is there any reason for that? No. So what can we do? Our tests are running on a, its own Jenkins instance that's not building software. When your build is ready, you can order the test from our Jenkins uh, server or whatever automation server we're using. And we're using lockable resources here. Uh, and uh, so you see this uh, M M712, it's locked by a running test. So that resource or a test run has been ordered from the build server because software is ready. And so it's locked that machine for the duration that that test is running. And Jenkins has fantastic, fantastic support for queuing. So when another build is ready, and it's asking for a build against this, uh, a test run against the same target, that new order just puts itself nicely in the queue and waits very patiently until the first test is done. So this is, I think, a really good strategy for using that precious machine time. Don't wait for compiling. It's not our business for tests. Just when your code is ready, we'll test it. If everybody wants me to test their code, well, wait in line. Uh, this is our rig. Uh, we've got Jenkins. Um, and you see, we have some tests that are just triggered on timers. Others, maybe, that are getting ordered by request. Uh, we have that GUI that you saw. Uh, that's a React application. It's got a node backend. And uh, I come, came to the conclusion that, oh, <laughs> Jenkins can use the same communication protocol to talk with the back end that the front end does. It can just go over WebSocket. So this means that my Jenkins server, which is running on Linux, doesn't have to have all the resources for my test run. 
uh, configuration files, um, JSON, schemas, pictures for screen dump comparisons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's a very nice thing, in fact. I like breaking up according to responsibilities. It's not my Jenkins server's responsibility to have all your stuff. Uh, so that was just a nice lucky thing that uh, we found out. And then we're using Behave, so we're running on Python. And uh, we've got uh, uh, a nice API that we've developed uh, for quite a while for working with uh, test, uh, uh, for working with um, reverse vending machines. And we're talking to those reverse vending machines over a lot of different protocols, mainly SSH. Uh, we've also got some real-time tests that are actually opening a back channel over WebSocket so we can get real-time actions and set up a trigger and make things happen at exactly the right point to trigger that nasty bug that's impossible to trigger. But uh, yeah, and one thing, Behave uh, has its fantastic library and it's really, really easy for us to get Behave to generate uh, JSON files that are nice to um, send into our uh, Elk stack. And I'll cover that a little more, uh, how we're using the data out of this, uh, this rig. We're also sending build data uh, from Jenkins uh, to our Elk stack as well. Um, yeah, so that's basically our rig. Um, one thing, <laughs> uh, again, we want to make use of that uh, precious machine time. So we've got basically one um, template for a test run. Uh, when we're, and we start with a feature that is going to try and get the machine ready to go, ready to be able to be tested in some sort of state where it can be tested. Uh, then we can have uh, a feature that's going to set up uh, some prerequisites for uh, the test. And that's a special one. Anything, any feature that starts with setup underscore, if it fails, we say, okay, forget this test run if we haven't managed to set up the prerequisites for it. This could, test could go right. Let's not waste time. Next test sitting in the Jenkins queue. For sure. um, after that, uh, maybe there's a test that fails. So, um, dot feature is the convention for uh, behave for a uh, Gherkin file, by the way. Um, if it fails, then we call that fixed state again to try and get the machine back up uh, on its feet and ready to go for a new test. Uh, yeah, so that's basically it. Again, maximize uh, the amount of tests that we actually manage to run. We don't want the machine to be down and in a sad state and doesn't want to work in the rest of the evening. We want it to work all night on a lot of different software branches. Um, but our platform, this is uh, a bit important, uh, the test itself uh, and everything for running the test uh, can be um, debugged, run and debugged uh, from a developer or a tester um, PC. So we don't uh, have, we're not starting anything in an external process. So we can debug from platform code around the test into test code and back to platform code whenever that uh, switch happens. So we have an older system that's uh, a Java-based um, uh, web application, and uh, it's starting the Python processes in a new process, but a lot of the, the, the code that's also part of the test platform is also written in Java. So there's basically no easy way to debug back and forth. So we ended up just printing things out to the console. And God, that takes about 100 times more. And I think there's a lot of time. And I think, I think testers would say, oh, OK, well, that's how we do it. But a developer, I don't think, in 2021 is really going to accept that you're going to debug things by running a test and looking at console output. That's just kind of a no-go. Um, <clears throat> another thing, uh, traceability. So one very nice thing with Jenkins is we uh, have source code tracking. So anything that uh, um, could impact the test uh, should appear in the change log associated with the test run. So when the test fails, it's, oh, facepalm. Yeah, I was in there yesterday. I changed that platform code around the test. My fault, sorry. We don't waste time uh, <laughs> figuring out if this is a real bug or not. Um, yeah, a uh, little bit of small tips. So this is maybe a nice one for developers. Uh, decide where 
you should test and have a holistic, holistic view of where uh, things should be tested. Uh, testers are eager for end-to-end -end tests, but often a code test, even for really big functionality, is the best place to do it. Um, if it's written in catch two, which the testers can understand, that's great because then the testers see what you haven't test. We're doing a lot of recognition. We have some hefty recognition algorithms uh, and it really works better that we're running these in Qt tests because we can mock away all of the inputs from the machine sensors, which we really can't instrument so well in an end-to-end -end test. So it's absolutely right that we're testing these recognition, this recognition functionality in C++ tests. I, as a tester, think, you know what, that's great. I don't have to end-to-end -end test it. But I do ask the question, um, maybe, maybe we should have more instrumentation so I can make uh, the reverse menu machine hallucinate uh, a little bit of things coming in from one or another sensor. I, yeah. So always ask the question. Um, but as said, uh, if you, for example, use catch2, uh, developers and testers can take stock of what's covered, what's not covered, and think a little bit strategically. Uh, this one, this is important. Uh, when you have test runs, uh, you see uh, that when the numbers of failures increase on a very, very, um, what's the opposite of s steep, not steep slope, the value of your test run goes down extremely steeply. Basically, if you've got a test run of 30 tests and five are failing, it's probably worthless at that point. Um, so you have to invest some time working on making sure that there's no uh, <laughs> fail, fail, as we say, <laughs> wrong, <laughs> wrong failure. Uh, test ops. Um, yeah. I was a, a, a training narcoman for a while, and so there was Strava. If it didn't happen on Strava, it didn't happen. I've grown out of that. But if it's not rolled out, deployed automatically, it's not deployed. Um, configuration is code. Everyone here is pretty much a developer. You really don't want to click through 30 or 60 Jenkins projects. Click. Wait, 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 okay. And uh, so should be using pipelines, uh, obviously, in source control, fix them, in source control, check them in, and everything is nice. Um, yeah, I don't think that really needs to be belabored. Uh, more thoughts about test stops. Um, get rid of these big, dark blocks. Uh, we have, for example, when you set up a server, uh, everything more or less should be scripted uh, often. Oh yeah, I needed to just set up this and that and uh, edit a configuration file here and God knows what on the machine, firewall, something like that. Um, problem is, what happens when somebody leaves the company? What happens when someone else gets responsibility for it? These things if it's not in code, it's not documented, basically. Uh, we use Ansible for uh, rolling out our deployment. Anybody using Ansible? Nobody's using Ansible. Ansible's, Ansible's great. Uh, we have Ansible on a Linux server, and we uh, a number of our uh, backend servers are on uh, our Windows. And it's uh, you just <laughs> have building blocks for all kinds of uh, deployment uh, that you could ever wish in there. They're nice, they work, it just works. Um, yeah. This one, now new shift, talking about uh, dashboards and analytics. So we use Elk, there are other solutions out there. But um, why do we use this? Well, we're trying to harness the power of small incremental changes. There was the Big Bang, where everything happened really, really, really fast, and huge things happened really fast. And then a few milliseconds later, we went over a new regime, which is small incremental changes. There is nothing more powerful in the universe, maybe the Big Bang, but it only happened once, than small incremental changes. That's why we're here and don't have so much hair. <laughs> um, so, uh, but the thing is, and here I'll be a little bit dogmatic, if you claim you're agile and you have no way of tracking small incremental changes, 
you're not agile, basically. That feedback loop has to be there, and it has to be fine-tuned enough that you can actually see the small stuff, that is, the small steps on the way to things becoming good. Um, yeah, so here's one of our dashboards, and uh, one thing is uh, just tips. Make sure that you have some mutually reinforcing consistent uh, data points. So this is a very small test run, but we see we have one feature that failed, and underneath that, we've got fail. Uh, a little bit more details about that. Um, down here, uh, yeah, can't see the build number uh, because the screen's a bit small, but uh, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, there was one failure here. It has the same build number as that there. So there's a lot of different data points that uh, help people understand and also help you understand when you make the dashboard uh, when you have a problem, when your dashboard is not consistent, not working. Um, this is one of my absolute favorites. This is test failures over time. And you can see... Uh, it was stormy weather here. You don't see the scale, but it was three or four tests, basically. It's a small scale. And suddenly, the stormy weather stopped. What happened? Well, I had something that was a listener on the network that had trouble getting a hold of sockets, basically. And so this listener that was uh, supposed to take some messages coming off the RVM, it wasn't getting the socket on the machine to listen. And it was, it was fairly awful. Um, but eventually, I figured it out. And you see, there was one data point there where there was some catastrophic failure. But basically, you see, problem, 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 test run, worthless test run. Oh, now it's good. Now it's working. Um, yeah. Um, some guiding questions for when you're doing this. Should you use the default data from your um, automation server? Uh, anyone using the Jenkins Logstash plugin? Oh, OK. Really nice, actually. So you get everything from your test run, build number, build duration, uh, tests that failed, tests that passed, uh, everything. Uh, man, but also, we've actually decided that we need to make a custom mapping that takes stock of things that are important uh, um, for tests, for example. Um, uh, extra information about failures or something like that. Or Jenkins, for example, uh, maybe will give you build time in milliseconds. And there's not so many people that are so good at relating to milliseconds if you make a graph. Um, full text search. Uh, that, I think, is very important. What we can do with this test rig is we can say, in a test run, here is a signature of a failure. Here's the signature of a problem. This, when this appears in the log, this machine target has this problem, or the software has this problem, and I can just search that up in uh, Elasticsearch Discover and find all instances in all test runs, in all targets, in all branches, export it as an Excel file and say to the development team, here you are. You fixed this in this branch, in this branch, in this branch, but Obviously, you haven't integrated the fix in this branch here. Did you forget? Um, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that is massively valuable that you can test, can, and developers, obviously you people, uh, these tools aren't so hard to use, can pull out this information yourself. And that is really, really valuable to have instant oversight over the scope of a problem and is the problem fixed. Um, yeah, and the other thing is, are there problem areas that are only evident over time? And those problems, which way are they going? Um, so we can't call this scientific. There's far too many variables, but that doesn't matter. Um, one thing that uh, analytics and dashboards help you see through are biases, because they're facts, basically. Uh, and uh, one thing we would love to believe is that there's a linear relationship between the quantity of effort and the effect. Sorry, <laughs> it's not. Sometimes it's that tiny little change that you didn't even realize you made that made a world of difference for better or for worse. Whereas you've been banging your head against the wall with a problem for months and... Mm, 
maybe a tiny bit better. So these kind of tools give you the feedback, help you see through that bias. Um, yeah. Uh, this, uh, so uh, new, new shift, new shift in the talk. Uh, this guy, Greg Pascal, uh, he, I read a blog post in 2019 when I was starting to do this and I thought, oh, there's another person actually doing this. I know developers have dashboards. All of you, all, who doesn't have a dashboard? No, I shouldn't ask you that because then you'd look dumb, but everyone has a dashboard. But maybe with test and doing this kind of thing with test, I'm not sure so many are doing it. But uh, one of the things now I'm thinking about, and this is a nice quote, is green isn't necessarily good enough. How is it green? So, um, build time, test run time. Yeah, the test passed, for example, but if it sat there and gagged for a half hour before it finally said, okay, that's not the same green. Uh, down below here, receiver failures. Uh, I should, uh, yeah, well, anyhow, it was a graphic that showed that problem I had with my listener getting access to a socket. Uh, here, uh, that down there, I can pull it up a little bit. Um, that nicely disappeared. So that corresponds to that graph I showed you, problem, 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 problem. Ooh, smooth sailing, finally hit it. Uh, I was subclassing uh, um, a bunch of internal things in that uh, uh, library is using, uh, trying desperately to find some solution to it, and finally, uh, with some small thing somewhere else. Uh, typical, right? The amount of effort doesn't necessarily translate to things getting better. Uh, here's our nightly run on this project. 28 tests, 28 tests. Oh, something really went bad there. <laughs> Nothing ran. Uh, and, but generally speaking, it's uh, smooth sailing. Uh, so this is, uh, yeah, the mental shift of seeing more than just green. Um, here, uh, this is uh, and somewhat of an ugly slide, but I think it's important. Um, and definitely something developers and testers should be working together on. Um, one thing you really need to do when you're producing some kind of log output uh, from test runs, for example, is distinguish between, uh, actually not distinguish, I'm sorry, um, put together uh, the same failures that have the same root cause. So group things by root cause. So bring things in. Now, it may not look like this is the same problem, but it really is. So somehow in your logging, tag it, flag it, so that you know this is the same problem. Because on the other end, when you're showing things on dashboards and uh, analytics, then you can distinguish. Yeah, we have this problem, and you can see over time that maybe it's getting a little better, but we have this other problem, maybe over time it's getting a little bit worse. So again, this is the way you pilot your effort um, about addressing problems. And basically what we are addressing are it's not about tests, right? Tests are about software. Tests are about the quality of your software. Tests are about getting on that little but wonderful scale of very small incremental improvements that translates to, for example, really, really good customer experiences when you're, somebody's working with your thing or your software or whatever. Um, other strategies, yeah, you don't see the whole thing here, but uh, <laughs> randomize. Uh, a lot of unit test tools do this for you. Um, often there are um, hidden dependencies between test run order. So if you're running your tests always in the exact same order, uh, randomize it. Um, this is something you can just integrate in your um, Jenkins pipeline script or whatever, just use the concept basically. Um, yeah, I have uh, some tests, maybe I'm doing that setup there, so obviously respect the order of things that must be run first, or maybe things that should be run last to clean up, but in the middle, or wherever you can, randomize. Um, test coverage. Um, this is really interesting. You, most of you are developers, so code coverage, uh, test coverage, basically. Uh, most all of you, I imagine, are using it. And the thing that's really valuable with uh, test coverage is not that percentage. I think pretty much all of us are in agreement that it's not the percentage. It's looking line by line 
what is covered, what is not covered. That's where the value is. Um, there are nice tools that allow you to connect requirements to test and you can run a report, which is a coverage matrix that will show which requirements are covered by which tests and conversely, which requirements are not covered. So that for end-to-end -end test is your test coverage measurement. Um, yeah. And the other thing, uh, so you have requirements and you have traceability between requirements and test cases. The other thing that's important um, is test management. If you have a nice analytics, search analytics dashboard solution, might be Elastic, might be Datadog, might be whatever the cool kids are using now. Um, that's great, it allows you to see things over time, but you basically, it's not a good tool, those in my opinion are not a good tool for defining a test set that should be run per software release branch, however you're grouping things to be able to say, we tested this. Now, almost even for uh, legal liability reasons, you need to have a test management system or we have experience that we do need to have a test management system that defines the set of tests that need to pass um, before we can put the, deploy the software out in the field. Because, you know, we have this, for example, Tumblr, this nice uh, new thing, have you seen it, where we can dump a whole, uh, whole bag of, uh, of objects in the uh, reverse vending machine and it spins around. You know, the kid detection algorithm in that thing needs to be good, obviously. Uh, for legal reasons. So you need to have something defining that test set. Um, uh, there's a, so I've got REC TM. There's a nice URA module. We're not using it. Uh, we've experimented with it called requirements and test management. And uh, this is a screenshot of how that traceability between requirements, we've got a model that breaks down between business system and technical requirements. And here you can connect to different requirements tests and then you can have a link uh, that takes you to the test in the test system and also requirements and test management it has that tm so it also has a rest interface that uh, your test runs can report to so you can also check off yeah we ran all the tests in our test set they ran green so when the kid got eaten by our new rvm well at least we we tried <laughs> yes question No, it's got some nice Excel import uh, possibilities. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Um, so just to summarize our uh, platform, this is a FLA, four-letter acronym, uh, to summarize our platform. Uh, Jenkins, behave, so Python behave, Elastic Stack, and we're using a test management and a little older open source uh, uh, um, test management uh, tool called TestLink. It's, it's okay. Uh, I think uh, uh, RTM, Requirement Test Management, with uh, Injira uh, could be uh, and also a very nice alternative. Um, yeah, uh, this is that GUI that we're going to uh, open source. Um, so that's going to come out soon. Um, do you want a demo? Okay. I'm not used to being in a room like this doing this, so it'll probably go horribly, but uh, we'll do it anyhow. I think I'm in the wrong uh, project. Sorry. I am.
Hey, looks like it's going to behave. Um, so uh, we'll go ahead and we'll create a new feature here. I get a template. Um, we use tags for filtering. Uh, I find it's a nice way of doing things. So I see I have a tag defined. Uh, I don't have a tag defined. Uh, that scares me a little bit, but we'll, we'll try it. An example. Yeah, I think I understand why. And um, yeah, when you write a feature, so this is unknown territory, uh, given that uh, you people are more developers than testers. A feature is the thing you're testing, so probably shouldn't contain a verb. So um, uh, the benefits of documentation. Yeah, as a tester, um, so this is my user story as a test. <laughs> as a tester, I read the documentation so that uh, I don't waste time. And the scenario, yeah, we'll put a verb reading the documentation helps. Okay, and I have no data. Okay. Um, I wasn't actually planning. I didn't think I have time to do a uh, <laughs> a demo. So uh, I guess we'll uh, just end this in a whimper. Um, but uh, you would have possibility to search and uh, uh, for existing um, existing test steps, um, get them copied in and uh, drop them in here. Um, I'm not sure why where I went wrong here, but yeah, no, we'll end on a whimper. Sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, um, that's coming out, but I uh, wasn't prepared to do that anyhow. Um, any questions about this? Yeah. Can I answer that? Uh, it can't. So that is that dialogue that has to happen that uh, testers and developers need to work together to, uh, well, maybe the developer needs to figure out what the root cause is and then try and flag in the data that goes into the test system when this appears, when, when this root cause uh, comes up, flag it somehow that the search and analytics system can uh, distinguish that case from a case that has a different root cause. So this is a part of continuous improvement over time. So the test system, no, it can't do that. But uh, working on what you're putting into the system is just important as what you're displaying on the output side. So great question. So glad I, you cleared that up. Other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have a translation layer based on gradient or whatever mm -hmm. to this test action platform. Yeah. Uh, but would you imagine that this test trouble have an elegant API, some nice function? Mm -hmm. uh, would that, that translation layer, would that actually be worth it? Uh, it's easy to be a nice Python API. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have two responses to that. Easy for you, <laughs> but if you want to involve product experts, domain experts, uh, you, yeah, they can read a, a nice fluent API, but it's not as accessible for them. Um, behave in these other systems, what are they? They're basically uh, a nice system for function aliases. 
you put a human readable function alias on a, on a function. Um, but the, the thing is, is, there are some benefits. So I some identify fully as a developer, have uh, found that when I need to make a change, it actually goes maybe in the order of my test steps, it goes much quicker to just move my test step or copying an existing uh, uh, branch of my test and make covering a new variant out from an existing one actually goes faster and cleaner uh, with, uh, for example, this system of uh, function aliases. So, I, I'm, you know, uh, PyTest is uh, something, for example, I'm using a lot, and uh, so I'm not just writing tests here. I'm also writing a lot of unit tests and integration tests. But out of my experience, it, this actually goes faster, breaks less often. And the other thing is that benefit of when you're making your test dry and you're refactoring out repeated code uh, into its own test step. In my unit tests, I do that, but I always think, oh, what name should I give my uh, helper function there so people understand what I'm doing? These behave frameworks are actually that. It's giving a really nice human readable name to your function that you're abstracting out uh, for reuse. So, yeah, great question. Other questions? Yeah. What part of? Yeah, yeah, that's a wonderful question. Yeah, what, uh, what part of the organization was it that I got the most pushback from? Yeah, what was the hardest sell, the things they implement? To be really, really honest, um, my uh, test uh, colleagues often uh, would say things like, I'm used to testing software. This doesn't look like testing software. Load some software on the machine, test it. Why do I have to have this big test rig, for example? That was, that was one thing. But Tomra actually has been quite good about automatic testing for a long time. So they have an older fitness sort of clone-ish thing that they've been using. Um, so to go over to Gherkinsbroke away from the, the fitness way of doing things, for example, uh, that was... Uh, I didn't think this was difficult. I'm a developer and I thought, this is natural language. <laughs> you should be happy with this. It's not technical. It's human readable. It's domain. But people thought, oh, it might be hard. I think the search and analytics thing, uh, people didn't necessarily see the immediate value of, for example, also. So I think that's another, another issue. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, um, that's, that's a great question. Uh, everything revolves around Python Behave, which is a library I cannot recommend enough. It's got really, really smart extension points that allow you to hook in your company's needs in the framework in an elegant and isolated way. There's, it's, it, it generates fantastic flexible log output. Uh, it's ex yeah, it's, it's it's just smart, and and it it very much follows the least uh, surprise principle. Basically, you're just you know sharing functions with a pretty function alias. Basically, that's the bread and butter of it. But that is a very powerful thing. Um, yeah. Other questions. Yeah, I'm sometimes one, sometimes the other, but mainly, you know, it's, it's really, really nice actually to have human language to focus the discussion around. Because the, the, the essential question, behave, right? 
How is the system behaving? What is the behavior of the system? So we're focusing on that. And even as a developer who likes code, it's really easy to get lost in the details of the implementation of the code. And code isn't, all, isn't the most optimal way to express requirements, even though often we have to use it that way, right? So moving to a language for expressing requirements that's made for expressing requirements is really good for keeping everybody on track and creating a conversation that is accessible to all the people that you want to have in the conversation. So that was a shot at answering your question. I don't know if that covers it. You can, you, you, then that, that's the great thing. You can loop the customer into this and say, is this right? And this should be, you should write your function aliases in a way that, uh, you know, um, functional people, not us dysfunctional programmers, but functional people can relate to and understand. That's kind of the rule, right? Uh, with uh, when we're writing these test steps. Does the domain expert, not the programmer, understand it? Great question. Other questions? No? Okay. Thank you very much.